friends in the office. I won't criticize my friends. But the superior, their, their psyops, I will criticize. Why do they do this? It's beyond my comprehension. They don't have to do this. The people want to know the truth. The young people want to, the young kids want to know the truth. Give them the truth. So uh, that's the answer. These are another intelligence. They're ahead of us. They've proven it. And only one simple reason. They can fly in space and we can't. So it boils down to that simple. How are you going to overcome that? You got to. We don't know anything about the how. So we got to start with what we know. The little we know is the greatest gift they gave us, not the hardware. I wasn't at Roswell in 47. 47, I just come back from Italy. I'd been chief of security intelligence in Rome. And in the intelligence business, I was trained really by the British. I was an MI-19. So when I came back, I went to Fort, Fort Raleigh, Kansas. I was stationed there. It was uh, the veterinarian postal. And we had a, still had horses. And I was instructor at the intelligence school. And we had an aggressor force we, that I was. So one night, I was post-duty officer. Post-duty officer means that I was in control for that night, I was the one that checked all the guards, checked all security areas. In fact, checked the whole post. I was the duty officer that night. And I went to the veterinarian section, and one of a sergeant I knew very well was sergeant of the guard that night. I told him, Sarge, how's everything around here? And he said, fine, sir. I told him, you know, they told me to be careful to watch this area because you have a sense of something sensitive here. He said, you want to see it, sir? I told him, yeah, let's go look. And I knew the sergeant, he was a master sergeant. I went back, and he, there was five crates there, like five or six, I think it was five. I lifted one up, and here's this body there, and floating in fluid. And I looked at it about 10, 15 seconds, not much more than that. So I put it back down, and I said, Sarge, come on, get out of here now. I don't want to get you in trouble. Because I'm the duty officer, I can go around, walk around here. But you might get in trouble for coming back. Just come on, let's go. go. Come out with me. So we went out, and I told him, where did it come from, Sarge? He said, well, five trucks came through, are coming through here from uh, an airfield in, in New Mexico, and they're heading for wright Patterson Air Force. Now, in those days, you know, there weren't all these big uh, roads. Now, in, the, in those days, Route 40 was about the only cross-country route. And the route that they took was Route 40, going through Fort Riley, Kansas, and then up to Wright Patterson Air Force. And I said, well, stay away from her, Sergeant. I don't want you to get in any trouble. I told him, I can walk around and see. So, and I started to figure, what was that? First, I thought it was a, a child, because it was small. Then I looked at this head and all, right away, and this was only happened a matter of seconds. Then I put the end back down. And uh, the head was different, the arms were spindly, the body it was gray. So right at that moment, I figured, uh, I don't know what this thing is. So like an intelligence business, I just better put it in the back of my head here and wait to maybe in the future I get cooperation so I can evaluate what it is. So I promptly forgot about it. Ten years later, I was down there, commanded the range in New Mexico, in White, White Sands, the Army Missile Firing Range in northern, right near Trinity site, my headquarters was. So my own radar started picking up items going three, 4,000 miles an hour in this area. I had pencil beam radars which locked on the target. And the boys told me at about three or 4,000 miles an hour, quick acceleration, they break the lock. And that was one of the best radars we had during the time. So every time that would happen, once I notified our headquarters, they said, well, forget it, we're not interested. So I figured I won't tell them anything anymore. So I, uh, every time that would happen, I'd tell the boys, bring me the tapes. Because all my computers and my firing had a tape which gave the whole firing sequence. And then we could check it after if anything went wrong. See? So I'd, take, I'd tell them, deliver the tapes to me personally. And I'd look them over. And yet what they told me was true. Then I left and went to Germany. And I started picking up the same things in Germany, three, 4,000 miles over flying Germany. Again, the pencil beam radar would lock on, 
and then all at once the lock would break. Just before that, I was four years at the White House, and I kept getting reports there. But they were just reports. I mean, and I, uh, they weren't actually cast in any sense that you put them in a file and keep them all together. They just were sporadic reports that came through. Of course, I had all the clearances, so I'd get them, even code reports I used to get. And, all. and I did get one time a report that NSA was getting signals from space, which were not just space noise or, uh, you know, or unscrambled or something you couldn't read. They were, they were really very perfect and looked like something was guiding them. There was a real message. But we were never able to decode it. This was a, a, a very coordinated message. It wasn't space noise or jam or jumble mumble or anything like that, or just noise coming. It was a pattern. So the evaluation may have, might come from out of space some beans. And I got that airport, that report when I was at the White House, because I had the NSA clearances and all. And when I came back, General Trudeau pulled me in. He had reorganized a research and development from a secondary mission logistics to a, a very compact, good unit, about 3,000 officers. It wasn't too compact. And, and then I went, he made, uh, first when I reported in, I was a special assistant. Then he created the Foreign Technology Division about a week later and put me in charge of it. There I started getting the Tosser reports. I started getting other crash reports, the artifacts I got. And by that time, I established, and I'd visited the site here. But then when I came to research and development, which was 14 years later, by the way, I inherited all these artifacts and I inherited the uh, reports, autopsy reports from Walter Reed Hospital. Now, Walter Reed, there was a laboratory there, which was our laboratory, and we financed. That's who did the autopsies for us. But we didn't leave any copies to them. All copies had to come back to us because after all, it was our lab. We financed it all. So there, started getting indication, proof, that a crash really happened here. Of course, then I kept it quiet for 35 years. I had it both with the general, and I didn't reveal the names of people. Even he criticized me. He said, 35 years you kept a secret, didn't even tell your family. I thought, why should I tell anybody? No, the general told me, he said, Phil, you can keep, let's keep a secret. When I die, though, I relieve you of my oath. Three days ago, the general died. And I start putting all this on paper. My grandchildren, he said, what would you do during the war? I said, I better leave them a legacy. Really, I had no intention of ever writing a book, being in the military like that. But finally it evolved and gradually moved up. I started to write, and then evolved into this, finally. So that's the background, my background. And I, as I say, I had the evidence that the, a crash did happen here. And where did it happen? The site that I went to the other day was CNN. Because that's the one, I've been to that site now, the, that's the fifth time I've been there. The one I saw was in, uh, at one of the air bases. Yeah, I'm not going to say where it was, but it was there. And that was it. I didn't go in it. And uh, I say that I had a lot of information on what was inside. There was nothing I could gain by going inside and looking at it. I had the drawings, how it looked inside. I had what was in there. And really, to go in, it had been curiosity. And uh, in those days, I didn't have the time for your curiosity. Wooler Smith is really the man that first put in my mind when nuclear binding coming apart on things. And he was a magnetic, you know, uh, really, he was a genius. And the Canadian government really treated him bad. You know, and then uh, I was supposed to go to his laboratory visiting because the general told me when his the general told him, you know, Smith, he said, you and the colonel have a lot to talk about. I'll let the colonel come up and visit you at your lab on Mayborough on, on Lake Ontario. Well, I put it off, put it off. In 1962, I decided to go up. I called up, and they, they told me Mr. Smith died of cancer. And I never really got to go to his laboratory. But he, uh, he gave us a piece, a medal, that he took from a flying saucer. You exchanged, didn't you? We exchanged, and he brought ours back later. I was going to ask you what, one last thing. If, if you uh, only had a moment to speak in open congressional hearings to discuss what happened 50 years ago, what would you say? I'd say it happened, and I'd add on to that. Give us information to the young people of the world in this country. They want to hear it. They want it. Give it to them. Don't hide it and tell lies and make stories. They're not stupid. They're not uh, young men that will panic. In fact, my own nephew was a research director of Daco Corporation, he tells me, he says, Uncle Phil, why don't they tell us the truth? We're not going to panic and pull our hair out. 
And one good example of this, which I always tell, the, to prove this point that the young people will want it and they're not going to panic, they want to hear this. And that's one of the reasons I wrote this. Even my own grandchildren now will see it. And I always prove it this way. I commanded a battalion of 1,500 men, combat battalion. Average age of my soldiers was 19 and a half years old. I told my exec one day, my God, Maine, we're, we're sending babies into battle. And these kids, they fought the greatest armies in the world. They didn't run. They didn't panic. They stood there and fought. <laughs> and I, I, I don't what do you think they'll panic? They want this information. They deserve it. It's their information. It doesn't belong to the Army or the Department of Defense. It's theirs. If it's classified, take the classification off and give it to them. Who's covering it up now? I mean, is there any one organization? Look, that... I always say this. Now, here's what I say. The government is so big and so vast that if you leave it alone, it'll cover itself up. When I had a, I testified in front of missing prisoners of war in front of Congress, the Senate, and later, not too long ago, in front of the House. And they asked me a question like this, and I told them, look, you know, it amazes me when a Scowcroft, a General Scowcroft, and a Kissinger can come up here in front of you gentlemen and say there's no information there. I sent it myself from Tokyo over a teleconference over a two-year period. How can I say that? And all the families were sitting there, and they wanted to hear this, see. Later on, I, we searched for it. We found it. It had fallen through the cracks. The politicians didn't care. They want their own little bailiwick, their own little ego, and do their own little job and get in the newspapers. If, if a family, if a, a prisoner's war missing from families, they don't care. And I brought this out when I testified. And the cover-up happens like that sometimes with nobody doing anything. It'll cover itself up and fall through the cracks, as I put it. And we never trusted CIA because in, the, in my day, Stalin gave orders to get to this information that came out of Roswell to some of his top scientists and agents. That order went out. And we knew that, and the special intelligence that I was in the Pentagon, which was very closely held, KGB trying to penetrate that, but they never did. And we knew that Stalin, they send agents out all over this area here to try to get information on Roswell. And yet we stood back like fools and said it didn't exist, it was a weather balloon. They didn't think it was a weather balloon. Countries in Europe are taking this very serious, and not like us here. They're not going to put out stories that there were dummies came out of the air or people with big heads. Those people are a little more serious about this than we are. But around here, you know, I'm even surprised to see the reaction from these people. Because somebody like me has never been out like this, you know, and, and after being in the military, you don't go out and give interviews and, and write books and things like that. Because we gave, when we gave the information out, we gave it out and, and, and insisted they take the patents. But also we put a little bit of a requirement on there, requirement feed it back to us for the competitive edge of the Army, take the patents, make all the money you want, but give it to the American people and give it to the world. If you, the Japanese, they interviewed me, and I told them, when we put the integrated circuit out, we also gave it to you. <laughs> I've testified in front of six congressional committees. I'm, if they want me to, providing it's serious, and they're not going to put it in the archives and just put it away, and when I went to Robert Kennedy, I, this is a provision I put on, I would testify if I went four years to the White House, that it, something is done with it, not just Congress sitting up there for publicity purposes. I'll go any time they want to. There's no, no hitch on me. And I'll tell them any, anything they, they want, providing they're serious. I won't go up and have, help a senator or congressman get elected. Look, there's a lot of stupidity involved, let's face it. Maybe mine was a little stupidity. I kept this quite so long, but I had notes with the general that I wasn't going to talk to. Lee. He died three years ago. And, and also other people involved, and like I told you before, I couldn't take, I don't reveal them unless they want to come forward to this bill. There's enough electromagnetism in this world where it can draw. So the extraterrestrial, he's a little different. He's composed in a way of cells also, like I should, humans are. This structure has some metallic surroundings that have to survive in space from debris in space, which keeps striking it constantly. It'll knock holes in it. So there's a little different strength there that will last a few more years. It is really almost a, 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 a biological, type of biological structure because the, the extraterrestrial fits in it. 
but made with a little more strength that's needed in the extra. Remember, these cloners that made these things made them in a way where they would fit in what they wanted to fit in. The, the ship itself is maybe a, a biological type structure because of the cell and the atom structure. But it's all created with more strength because it has to resist more. This being is protecting the way. Now when this being comes in this world, he will wear a suit, skin tight suit, which we found. His skin is atomically aligned and his suit is atomically aligned. That's to repel radiation and harmful effects, even cosmic action. Since he doesn't breathe air, the ones that come alive on, in this world will have a type of helmet on them. And since he doesn't speak, he has no vocal cords, he will have something that intensifies a transmission that he maybe can communicate. Well, the body, the head really wasn't that big, but in portion to the body, a small body, it looked big. And the eyes, there was no nose or anything like that. It had spindly legs. So that was about it, because I didn't have any autopsies. And I just put it off, because I figured, well, maybe someday I'll get cooperation and be able to evaluate. Later, I got my hands on the autopsy report in 1961, when I took charge of the Foreign Technology Division from Walter Reed Hospital our own laboratory. So there I start putting it all together. <clears throat> what did you read in the autopsy reports? Well, the, the nature of the body inside. Because before that I never knew that. They did an autopsy and they cut it open all, the brain and all. And the brain was different and, a lot of the, and most of the body was different. But it, no nose, no mouth, no ears, it, no vocal cords. No digestive system, no sex organs. So then we came to the conclusion that it was a humanoid clone. So that's, and as I say, I was when I saw the, the body, there was nothing else to go on. Later on, though, I got the autopsy reports that uh, experts had done, our own experts. Discretion better part of valor. We st just kept it to ourselves. Only some certain people know about it, head to head, brain to brain, no paper trail. And we were able to accomplish something. Now discussions with the, the German scientists, now they, we had discussions. General Trudeau told me one day, it took us five years to develop, fully develop a transistor that somebody else started, and the integrated circuit. If we didn't have the help, like Obert says, that we've been helped, and and, well, and Smith said to the boys upstairs, it would have, General, it would have taken us 250 years. The message in my book that I like to see is that the younger generation look at this and see what we did and see the help we got from outer space, and these beings exist. And let the young people know that that's the future that they're going to be seeing and live with. And you got it a good example. Mitchell already confirmed a lot of this. That's what I think the message of the book is and what I like to see it do. Let the young one people, we're old, we're going to be gone. Let those young people, they need this help. They're going to be the ones that carry it on. It's been right, only we, through our stupidity we didn't do it right. Now it's coming out. And look how it's snowballing. The general public is not stupid or dumb. They can recognize a lie or the truth. Give them the truth. I'm trying to tell the younger people, this is it. Not people like me, I'm 82 years old, what's it going to make to me? But these young, these three, my little grandchildren, they got to know this. They're going to be living this in the future. Let them know how it started, where the seed came from. Intentional or unintentional doesn't matter. It came, that's all. Whether they gave it to us or not is not important. We got it. We had it. Whether they gave it to us intentionally or it was a mistake or something, that doesn't matter didn't really operate as a family unit, um, being open about our feelings. Everything was kept a secret, and so that was carried on, you know, even my mother, you know. Um, and so it, it affected us as, as human beings, and it, 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 you know, when I graduated school, it was very difficult to interact with people because I felt, I felt that there was